All right, welcome back to another episode of Real Talk. This is the top 21 games of Michigan football in the Jim Harbaugh era. This is our last uh, episode of those. Jeff here, Dan, what's going on, man? How much, buddy? Um, been a long, long awaited for this whole thing, and we are down here on the back nine, the back stretch, and just uh, this one's going to be fun, man. We got a lot to get through today. Yeah, you know, we've had a great list. I'm going to re- recap it in just a second here. We're down to our last five. We'll have one more honorable mention just for funsies. Uh, it's been a really fun list. I think there's been a lot of takeaways for me personally. I hope there are for you. We'll talk about those a little bit later. Uh, let's start with a recap. So some of the honorable mentions, we have 2022 at Iowa, 2022 versus Michigan State, 2020 at Rutgers, 2019 versus Iowa, 2017 at Indiana, and 2015 versus Northwestern. So those are all the honorable mentions. They didn't make the list, but we did recap those. And now here's the list in order. The 21st game was 2015 at Minnesota. Number 20 was 2016 versus Wisconsin. Number 19 was 2020 at Minnesota. Number 18 was the Cowboy Classic in 2017 versus Florida. Number 17 is the 2022 versus Illinois, the Jake Moody walk-off field goal. Number 16, the 2021 at Wisconsin. Number 15 is 2021 at Nebraska. Number 14 is 2016 versus Penn State. Number 13 is 2018 versus Wisconsin. 20, or number 12 is 2022 versus Penn State. A lot of Penn State here in this, uh, in this teen range. Uh, number 11 was 2015 versus Florida. This is Jim Harbaugh's only bowl win. Number 10 is 2018 versus Penn State. Number 9 is 20, this is uh, 2019 versus Michigan State. Number eight is 2019 versus Notre Dame. Those games literally take place about two weeks uh, away from each other. So um, good stretch of football being played in 2019. Number seven is 2018 at Michigan State. And then last but not least, before we get into our top five, number six was the 2021 at Penn State game, the Cade McAmeara to Eric All uh, a couple minutes ago in the game touchdown, which brings us to our top five. and. So what we did, if you did not listen to any of these, I just get, I just spoiled it all for you, obviously. Um, I advise you to go back. We recap them all. We give our opinions as to why they're there. But the, I think the one thing that's really important is I gave my list. Dan gave his list. We took the average, and we came up with these. And our top five was interesting because it was identical mm-hmm. except for order. We, we totally agreed on our top five games. The mm-hmm. order was a little different. So that's the, that's the one thing you could take away. So no, every other game, we could have varied by one or two games, three games, whatever. <laughs> but our top five was undisputable. We believe these are the top five games in the Jim Harbaugh era, regardless of how we do end up ranking them. But I think the rankings will surprise you. So, Dan, with that said, from 21 to 6, we're here. Opinions over what we've already covered. Yeah, man, it's uh, it's it's been a fun ride, and it's definitely, you know, I've always done it out of pure boredom, if, or if I'm sick at home from work one day. But you no, know, I'll rewatch highlight games, and you know, I I do it a lot more often than you do, really, when I make hype videos, because I have to, you know, really dig in and and find clips that I want to re reuse or, or use for the first time. So, um, you know, I mean. I'm married. I got two kids. I ain't got nothing else going on when they're in bed. So, you know, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I, I mean, I'm Michigan 24 seven. So it was really cool to revisit this and, uh, and, you know, talk about some things that we, um, dearly remember and then things that were, we had to get a little for fresher on that, uh, you know, like one, I think it was the 2019 Iowa game. I don't even remember what happened in that game. I don't know why to watch it again to see that, you know, so it was just really cool. Yeah, uh, the one thing for me, and obviously I don't make hype videos, but there were multiple games where I just didn't necessarily remember. Like, I looked over the box score, I seen this was a ranked matchup, and it's like, 
man, the highlights, the players, things that were jumping off the screen to me. I took mental notes. But here we are. Let's start with our honorable mention before we get into our top five. So there's one more kind of throwout game. This is 2015 at Indiana. Okay. Michigan's number 14 in the country. They're seven and two. They're at Indiana. Indiana's struggling in the year. They were four and five. Michigan already had losses at Utah and then against Michigan State, trouble with the snap game famously. Uh, what do you remember from this one? Yeah, I just I remember this being that that in the 2015 season of having a lot of, you know, close calls and two weeks prior to this game is the, the Minnesota, you know, goal line stand. And this is essentially another kind of a goal line stand again. Uh, Jake Rudock, you know, throws six touchdowns, 440 yards, you know, the games between Michigan and Indiana, especially since Brady Hoke, I mean, maybe even since Rich Rodriguez, there is absolutely no defense played sometimes, uh, especially in the secondary. And so, obviously, they were gunslinging it. You know, Nate Sudfeld's uh, behind center for for Indiana. Uh, people will remember Jordan Howard. Jordan Howard was one of the running backs that Mike Hart was coaching at this time over at uh, in Bloomington. And Jordan Howard, you know, goes – 238 for two touchdowns himself against Michigan. It was just a wild game. Um, uh, you know, J.U. Cheston obviously caught four of these touchdowns, just absolutely went off. Amara Darbo got involved. Jake Butt got involved. And then, um, you know, the, the the end there, whatever, where, um, you know, Michigan made, made a, a nice defensive play at the end to, to save this all. But, yeah, this was absolutely – just one of those Michigan Indiana games where it was just going to be basketball and grass. Yeah, I don't have a ton to add. I mean, you kind of touched on the big points. I thought Jake Rudock was incredible in this game. Uh, the one thing that I've said, if you know me at all and you hear me talk Michigan football, I've said this on a million occasions. I've said this on this podcast. I've said this during this series. And I will say this in 50 years because I truly believe this. Michigan was one more Jake Rudock season away from being a 2016 contender for the championship. Uh, I do believe they walk into Columbus with Jake Rudock and win in 2016. Uh, there's no other way to prove that because it never happened. But I, I just will, will go to my grave thinking that Jake Rudock just needed one more season because he was terrific at times in 2015. And this was one of them. Six TDs, 440 yards passing. Uh, super underrated receiver, and it's somebody that I can't believe we don't talk about more in just like the the Michigan regime of great players. J.U. Chesson was a terrific player in 2015, and truthfully, 10 catches for 207 and four touchdowns in this game. He was incredible. Yes. Uh, I would love at some point for us – and this is obviously a topic of conversation for another time, to break down receiving duos from the Jim Harbaugh era or mm. even the 2000s, because I do believe that J.U. Chesson and Amaro Darbo are mm. way up on that list, or should be. They should be. So, uh, like you said, Jake Buck gets involved. And, you know, the other thing I had down here, you already talked about it, Jordan Howard was incredible. 35 carries, 238, three total touchdowns in this game. Uh, he was a problem for Michigan all game and Michigan was able to finally uh, score late, but uh, anything else on this one, Michigan, what did you get the final in front of you? I didn't write it down. 48, 41, 48, 41 and double overtime. So uh, thank you for saying that. Anything else on 2015, Indiana? Well, real cool. Well, not, not about this game particularly, but J.U. Chesson and Amar Darbo. Yeah, you're right. Like, those are great hoax guys, and they had their best career seasons under under the Harbaugh umbrella. And Chesson uh, got drafted by the Chiefs. I thought that was going to be a good spot for him, and maybe he would have been able to have some sort of, like, longevity there because of his speed. Andy Reid likes fast guys, and he just never made it there, which was kind of unfortunate. And then Amar Darbo goes to Seattle. Never hear him again, and I thought Darbo had a chance to not be a superstar in the NFL, but because he was such a great possession receiver, never seen him drop a pass. Uh, I thought he could have been like a Jason Avant for Philadelphia. Like Jason Avant played, I sort of got a whole decade for the Philadelphia Eagles, and barely ever heard of the guy. But the dude was always consistently reliable, and he was always healthy. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I take away from that. I know we're gonna be going to our top five, so pretty much. We're going to be talking about the last two years almost, and 
So this is gonna be the last we talk about these guys, and I just wanted to say that before we moved on. No, no, I, I, I thank you for saying that because I would literally, there could be a whole podcast on the 2015 season because it really was full of ups and downs and potential and mm-hmm. miss, miss, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Misfires, basically. What, what could have been the Utah game week one? The trouble with the snap. So really the only ass beating in there was really the Ohio State game. Outside of that, they were in every game. There were a lot of close ones. The goal line stand at Minnesota, the goal line stand here. Uh, yeah, I mean, really fun season, as you alluded to. J.U. Cheston and Darbo were, were Brady Hope guys, but they balled out under Harbaugh. And that's kind of the, the, uh, the calling card of what's, what's a lot of these – 2016 2017 2015 players a lot of them had better seasons once Jimbo got there and that's kind of what we expected so yeah Alan, real quick too like I don't mean to prolong on this but uh no I we're good but like I mean there's always a million of what ifs and, and could have been and there's I uh, you know could count on my hands uh, or my fingers you know with my fingers of how many games are, could have gone either way but <clears throat> Two games in particular, one of them is 2015, which was the, the Michigan State game where the punt block happened. And then uh, the, that Rutgers 2020 game, the reason why I had that in my rankings, too, was, you know, if that if Michigan loses that 2020 game versus Rutgers, I think that does a lot for the future negatively. And I think if Michigan doesn't get beat by Michigan State in that last play of the game, I think a lot of things are different in the future uh, positively. So, uh just that was again the cool thing about going back to this yeah um are you ready to hit this top five let's do it baby all right so the one thing i I will say before we get into it um you may know what these five games are a lot of people reached out to me and said i know what four of them are and that's probably the case okay um what i think is going to be fun is where they get ranked and uh I'll be sure to tell you where I ranked it, and Dan will be sure to tell you where he ranked it. And that's what's fun about this and the discussion and the memories, uh, most of them all fond. So here we go. Number five, the 2022 Big Ten Championship game. Uh, It's number two, Michigan, 12-0 on the season, going to Indianapolis for the second straight year to play the Purdue Boilermakers, who were 8-4 on the year. Uh, weirdly enough, Purdue had to wait till the final week of the season to get this chance to basically earn this shot. It was between Purdue, it was between Wisconsin, it was between Illinois. Was there another one potentially in there too? It was weird. Four guys were three or four teams were kind of battling yeah. out last it, second. It was it was wild. It was, it was, yes. wild. It was wild. So while Michigan and Ohio State had basically played a championship game the week prior, Purdue was playing somebody and they needed another outcome and it was it was all kinds of chaos but here we are michigan seeking their stre- second straight big 10 championship uh here are the news and notes going into this i wanted to kind of throw a couple things out here blake Corum, he plays against illinois he has 100 yards in the first half he injures his knee not really sure what it is the following week against ohio state there's injury concerns all week will, will he play will he not he takes two carries for six meaningless yards more of that later um, right after that game, right after that game, Cade McNamara announces he's going to transfer. So Cade McNamara announces his transfer. He's a captain. Uh, post the Ohio State game, I kind of felt, uh, I don't want to use the word betrayed, but I thought it was poor timing for a captain to do this. And right, be- this game is played on December 4th. On December 2nd, just a mere he transfers after the Ohio State game, and before the week's even over, he commits to Iowa. Before we get into the game, just quick opinions on how that all transpired. We just beat Ohio State. You enter the transfer portal. You immediately pick Iowa, and we're playing in the Big Ten Championship game, and you're a captain. Go in on that. Yeah, I thought it was poorly timed. And again, that I mean, I don't really have much to add on to it other than that. I've, I've kind of said it before where, you know, there's some, you know, some spoiled, some spoiled grapes here, some sour grapes that with the Michigan fan base and Cade McNamara. Like, Cade McNamara, you know, doesn't owe the Michigan fan base anything. I mean, he he put us back in uh, on the map in the previous season. And, you know, 
at the first sign of uh, vulnerability, Michigan fans, for the most part, shit on them. So, um, you know, it, at my first reaction was kind of like, this is kind of shitty. But then, you know, I had to see, you had to see it from both lens. And, you know, poor timing, you can say that, but, you know, it, it's all, he was you know, trying to do what's best for him. And, you know, transferring and, and finding a destination sooner rather than later is probably better for personal game. And, you know, he probably just wanted to get to work. Uh, you know, he had, had surgery and trying to, you know, get healthy and get back into uh, winter conditioning and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's water under the bridge now. Uh, but, yeah, of course, at the time, the first initial reaction is a lot different than when you had time to sit and ponder. Back to the game. Michigan is seeking their first 13-0 and start slash season ever. So, big things going into this game. Take her away. So I was lucky enough to go to this game personally. Uh, back-to-back Big Ten championships, I had to go to both of them. This one uh, was a lot different of a feeling than the previous one, which obviously we'll be getting to rather uh, rather soon. So well, this was a business trip, and it felt like just Michigan was out for blood. Um, tailgated before this, the uh, Michigan fan base probably outnumbered uh, – Purdue 80 to 20. And, you know, Aiden O'Connell, the Purdue quarterback who my Raiders just drafted, uh, they believe that his cousin or his brother passed away tragically a week prior to this or a month prior to this. And so, uh, you know, I, I said in a preview pod, I'm like, no, you know, I'm not trying to be in, insensitive or anything like that, but we might have his Brett Favre type game when Brett Favre's dad passed away. He just went bananas the following week. And he did. He, he, he let Michigan up 366 of the air, two picks. Will Johnson took care of that. But um, him and his high school teammate, Charlie Jones, comes over from uh, – I can't remember where Charlie Jones came from off the top of my head. Well, Iowa. And, uh, you know, 13 for 162. It was, play, it was like Tom Brady and Julian Edelman out there. And, uh, you know, Michigan had great coverage pretty much this whole game. They're just dropping dimes. I mean, you can't – you watch the highlights, and it's just like you just have to applaud for – you know, the, the touch passes and the, and the catches and nothing you can do about it. Either way, Michigan doesn't have to rely on Jake Moody this game. He only kicks extra points. And uh, J, uh, J.J. McCarthy had some great passes in this one to Ronnie Bell. Uh, the other one was just Luke Schoonmaker on the top of my head, but those were like the real good ones. And then, uh, you know, Donovan Edwards obviously pops off in the second half. And so, you know, it was, um, it was just great to be there. And like I said, this one was more of a business trip. And you know, while I had a, a fun time, it just it was it's hard to explain. It's just a lot different than the year prior. But uh, um, yeah, it was a great time. No, I, I the business trip is definitely definitely the way to describe this game. We'll talk about this later. Trust me, we will. The twenty twenty one season will be well documented on this top five. But I think you would agree with this. This felt expected. Where in twenty twenty one, it almost kind of fell into our lap yeah like our goal wasn't to win the big 10 it was to beat ohio state yeah and in this game it was to literally represent in the final four slash national championship game so by beating ohio state and going undefeated this was a byproduct i mean yeah it it was a business trip we anticipated being in indianapolis once we got here it was just a pure um at that point, it's just a formality. We're here. We're ready to go. We're going to win, and we're moving on. We have other we have other fish to fry. Purdue's just in the way. So, a yeah. um, couple of memories for me. Michigan was slow in this in this this game. Uh, they started slow, and as you alluded to, they were able to just dime up Charlie Jones. Uh, they're winning fourteen to thirteen at the half. There wasn't a ton of uh, big splash plays or any feeling in the world that Michigan was just going to dominate this game, but. Uh, Donovan Edwards, 185 yards and a touchdown. I thought J.J. McCarthy for the second straight week played really good. He had the really nice uh, lob throw to Colson Loveland for the first touchdown of the game that okay. he just kind of mosses the defender. And Colson, you kind of get the first glimpse of, yeah, that dude's a man, like mm-hmm. a man. Uh, and then, of course, my cousin, Will Johnson, not my real cousin, but maybe, uh, two <laughs> picks and kind of shows up for the second straight week. You know, there was a lot of that. So, uh, yeah, I liked this game. You ranked it fifth. Yes. I ranked it fourth. Uh, 
we got it here at number five. I'm going to ask you later, so I'd rather you not elaborate now, but um, anything else on this game? No, I, um, I think I, I think I've pretty much pointed out everything. Um, yeah, uh, back to back, babe. Back to back, and uh, as you can see here, my 2022 Big Ten Championship. Oh, look at us! Look <laughs> at us, just back to back. Okay, I'm enjoying this nice uh, Anger Orchard cold cider out of my 2022 13 and 0 Big Ten Championship glass. So it's fitting. Okay. <laughs> Number four, dialing it back a little bit here. The 2016 season, Michigan at Michigan State. Kind of the tail of the tape here. Here we go. So in 2015, we've already talked about it multiple times on this pod and through this entire series, Michigan has trouble with the snap against Michigan State the year prior. Um, one of the, my biggest false narratives under Jim Harbaugh is that he hasn't been able to beat Michigan State. Uh, when he does beat them, he beats them like a drum. And there's been a couple of seasons, obviously the COVID year, uh, the trouble with the snap, and then the road loss in 2021. All those are very tough, close losses, but he, he lost those. But here we are in 2016, Michigan, number two in the country. They're 8-0, and and they're going up against Michigan State, who's 2-6. and six. Not really a great uh, a great record for them. Michigan rides a big 20-point second quarter here. Um, before I go into my memories, I'll let you take this one away. You obviously had this game ranked four. I had it ranked five. Uh, go ahead. Just like I said, this entire series, when you have an opportunity to beat your rivals, beat them down hard, and then beat them down hard in their own in their own house, you know, Ohio State fans have done it. Their Ohio State fans, Ohio State has done enough, uh, done it enough to us where this is just as enjoyable when we get to unleash this on someone else. And granted, 32-23 is an odd score. It wasn't really till the fourth quarter where Michigan State scored 13 points to kind of creep this back into something looks something respectable, I guess you could say. But this this game was utter dominance the whole way through. Uh, L.J. Scott for Michigan State, their top dog at running back. Uh, and, and so the stat column he did himself he did himself in, um, and outside of I was I actually got off. I had to work this Saturday at work. Um, yeah, I had to work till about noon, and this is when the game started. So I went over to Buffalo Wild Wings right by my uh, work right after, and uh, the first drive Michigan State drives right down seventy five yards, twelve plays, and L J Scotts celebrating the end zone, and, and you're just like, oh fuck, here we go. But Michigan State. Uh, can't do anything until the fourth quarter, like I just mentioned. And, uh, you know, Will Spate, I mean, did enough. And the Michigan run game was a little bit of everybody. Eddie McDoom, if anybody remembers Eddie McDoom, he had a, had a couple long runs uh, on the jet sweeps. But, you know, really, you know, the biggest memory I have out of this game is Amara Darbo just reeling in these ridiculous catches. Like, we were just talking about Amara Darbo. Um I forgot that he was actually in this game a second ago when I said we're going to be done talking about these guys. No, he's he's right here. And uh, after that, it really comes down to the last play of the game where you know D'Antonio is trying to, to to put the bandaid over his over his open wound, trying to go for two points, and then the ball gets fumbled and Jabril Peppers picks it up and runs it for two points. And uh, you know, for a while there, my profile picture on Facebook was Jabril Peppers running and in the background. You could see Mark D'Antonio with a sour look on his face. And that was just uh, music to my ears and just love it. Um, so other than that, that's all I really have for it. But yeah, um, just a phenomenal road win. And again, Michigan State finished two and six or was two and six after this game. But, you know, one and six, ten and six, you know, ten and one. I don't care. So my biggest memory from this game is the Jabril Pepper show. Let me just this is this game is the epitome of his career at Michigan. Here we go here. Five carries for 24 yards and a touchdown. And it's a highlight touchdown where he breaks the uh the pie line, diving in. Great. It's a it's a big uh big highlight score. He has seven tackles, two tackles for loss, and a sack. He has a two-point conversion. But not on offense. It's on defense. As you alluded to, they're going for two. It's fumbled. He picks it up, and he is blazing as clock runs out. 
for a two point conversion. And then he also has a catch in this game. It doesn't go for any yardage, but he has a catch. He also has a kick return and a punt return. Just literally a do it all. Jabril Peppers is the man in this 2016 season. And he stamps his stamp of approval all over this one. He is big. Uh, yeah, I thought this was a trajectory game for us. You alluded to this a second ago in 2015. If Michigan doesn't have trouble with the snap, things may be different. Mm-hmm. Michigan cannot, under any circumstances, lose this game. This mm-hmm. was Harbaugh's first quote unquote rivalry win, and he stomps the shit out of Michigan State and has in all his wins, truthfully. But uh, this one was big, and obviously, it's big for you. It was big for me. I had it five, you had it four. Um, Anything else on this one? Michigan wins at 32-23. No, I, I just, again, just music to my ears when I see this. And I, I remember, you know, there's always trash talk, especially now with Twitter and everything like that. I just remember, like, Riley Bulla and, uh, you know, Chris Frey, a lot of these older Spartans on this team, whatever, were running their mouths. And so it was uh, it was good for some of these Michigan guys to get the last laugh and, and get the rest after uh, – after what 2015 was, which I unfortunately was at. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Top three. Number three, the 2022 season. It's Michigan at Ohio State, the game. The reason I prefaced it with the game, it is the game. Number three, Michigan, 11-0. and travels to Columbus to play number two Ohio State 11-0. Michigan is seeking their first win. Sorry, Michigan's coming off their first win since 2011. Okay, they had got this, the win the season before. But their last road win in Columbus is in 2003. So it's literally t- damn near 20 years. Uh, or was it? 2000. Was right? 2000. Was it 2000? Yeah, so it's 2000. Sorry, I have the wrong fear here. I had a, As soon as I said that, I'm like, that doesn't sound right. Um, so it had been literally t- over 20 years. Uh, the last road one was in 2000. And this the Blake is, Corum. Hold on. Blake Corum. Is, hold on I swear to God. Hold on a second. I swear to God this was, uh, I think, when, I wanted to get this right because it's going to bother me. I think it's 2003. Hold on. So Michigan won the, na- or uh, Ohio State won the national championship in 2002. The very next year, I thought Michigan had beaten Ohio State, and that was their last time beating Ohio State, but it wasn't in Columbus. It's driving me nuts that I'm having this absolute brain fart right now. So, hold on a second. Jesus. All right. Thank God for Wikipedia.com, right? Okay. So, yeah, 2003 was the last time they won. In Columbus? That was in Ann Arbor. I take that back. So, no, you're right. It's 2000. Yeah. Yeah, because the odd years are in – in Arbor, and the even years are in Ohio State. So that would make sense. Yeah. So it is 2000. Sorry for that. Okay. Uh, Blake Corum gets injured the week before. We just talked about that. The entire week, his status is in question. What is Blake Corum going to do? Where where are we at with Blake Corum? Michigan has zero blemishes. Ohio State has zero blemishes. But now Michigan is without the arguably the leader of the Heisman race at this point. Um, and it's like, Donovan Edwards had just missed the game prior. He has a hand injury. We're really not even sure who we're going to battle with. Um, take it away. Yeah, this was, you know, obviously the the last two years going into the game, I I picked us. I picked Michigan to lose. I didn't have any. Uh, I didn't have any confidence, or I felt like at least this game, this one, this one might get out of hand just because of the injuries. You know, Mike Morris, Blake Corum. You know, that Kyle Hill Green was, you know, no call, no show all year long. And, you know, there's a couple other guys that were banged up. So there was a lot of question marks. And the Blake Horn one was obviously the biggest one. But, uh, you know, going into this game, I just I had so I still had a little hope left, right? And watching Blake Horn go out there and at least trot out there. And an attempt and and then fail. That was like the first sign of like where I just felt, you know, I don't say dead of the world. I just felt uh, grim. But um, but yeah. So, anyways, JJ McCarthy, 
three touchdowns. Everyone capitalized on all these plays. You know, I, I mean, I guess I go through the whole stat chart, but we know what that is. And Ohio State fans were all up in arms about, you know, the Jim Knowles coming in, his defense, we're going to stop the run. Urban Meyer says pregame, they're going to stop the run. And, you know, the whole narrative of, oh, yeah, there's only going to be, there's only a few places of this game. And then outside of that, Ohio State handed Michigan, you know, well, you know, Michigan capitalized on the game. And, you know, granted, they're the second half team all year round. And there's been a couple times where the run game, I say a couple times, it wasn't until after this and afterwards, but really the run game for Don Edwards picks up in the second. And it really did. And so when you know, Jason McCarthy hits those those throwing touchdowns, it softens up the defense in the second half. Offensive line is just building these holes. And then it wasn't really just like nothing, nothing, nothing. And then Don Edwards takes off. It was, you know, gradually getting five to 10 yards, 10 to 15 yards. It wasn't just, you know, white and black. Um, but C.J. Stroud, you know, makes some crucial errors at the end of the game. And, you know, Michigan, you know, holds Ohio State, which has got the probably the best offense in terms of air, you know, air, aerial assault in the whole conference and the whole country to 23 points. It, it was was awesome, you know, and we we talked about it in the what's that three in the second half, three in the second half. And, you know, um, you know, we talked about it after the game, you know, the Sanders slow pass breakup, the Taylor Upshaw interception. I mean, they were just every Wolverine stepped up and this is the type of rivalry game where if you have your a game, you got to, you know, put two pluses on the end of that and, and, and just take it to the other level. And that's what they did. And I remember you were over here watching the game at my house. I think I, we stood the entire, we sat, we initially were sitting down watching this game. This is how I am generally with Michigan Ohio state games, but we were sitting down. And then after JJ McCarthy hit uh, CJ, um, for the first touchdown, I don't think I sat the rest of the time. I was I was just pacing back and forth. And uh, when Donald Edwards busted out that first touchdown, I believe you were talking to me. And I was like, I tapped you on the chest, like, turn around. And then we're like, holy shit, busted it. And then the second one is when we did the Snapchat where we were like, let's go. That was, uh, that was I'll always remember that. And that was great. And I know I kind of went on a huge tangent right there. And I kind of lost my train of thought. So, absolutely. I don't know if you can see that. Let's go video. <laughs> but 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 uh but and then with Gus Johnson, Donovan Donovan again, 85 yards. Like I'll make that my retail, man. A couple things here. Um so obviously I can't wait to talk about 2021 here in a second, but this season is special in its own right. And I want to give it the credit it's due. So this was a fun year doing the podcast. Just every single week with utter confidence that we're beating everybody. Just it just felt it just, you know, the the motto is this team's the same, this team's the same. Uh shout out to Jerry. He's, you know, if you guys have heard you guys, I know you guys have heard him on this podcast. Uh, both for the mock draft. He did the Michigan Ohio State preview pod with us. I was on his podcast, the Trippy J pod. And I just wasn't going to surrender to the idea that Michigan was going to be contained. It was disheartening to know that Blake was probably going to be a shell of himself. And I didn't even think he wouldn't play two carries for six yards in this game. You could say he didn't play. Not even knowing if Donovan was going to really give it a go or what his status was with this this hand injury that was kind of up in the air. But my melody going into this game, you can find it on both the podcasts that Dan and I did prior to the game. You can find it on the Trippy J pod. It's not about Ohio State. It's about Michigan and what Michigan could do. And weirdly enough i was never jj's number one fan i was a cade guy i thought cade was qb1 and didn't necessarily lose the job jj did kind of take it with the hawaii game if you you know whatever want to get into that argument but i thought he was incredible in this game weirdly enough he was 50 percent passing 12 of 24 which was basically his mo but he had a pass that was against the blitz that cj took to the house 
And then our biggest gripe about him is that he couldn't hit an open guy to save his life. And he hit CJ on this deep 75 yard pass wide open, hits him in stride. He walks in. And then late in this game, after the Khalil Mullins third down and one jump pass, and people think he's a running back. He was a linebacker two weeks prior to this, okay? He takes a snap in this game on third down and one, and he throws the ball to Luke Schoonmaker. A few plays later, J.J. McCarthy does what Buckeye fans have begged C.J. to do. And this dude lowers the shoulder at the goal line to punch in another touchdown. Mm -hmm. And at this point, it's like, wow. Not only is Michigan taking the lead, but like Michigan can win this game. We at this point, it kind of had felt dead in the first half. It's like, man, outside those two CJ plays, Michigan had played really poor. Mm-hmm. The defense was pretty good, but they had played poor. After this play, it's like, oh, now here we go, here we go. And then it's one Donovan touchdown. The second one where we make the let's go video. You have it saved your phone. I have it saved my phone. I'll never forget that. Um, because at that point. We knew they were broken. Mm-hmm. Their will was so broken. And, you know, the, the game we just talked about, the 2022 versus Purdue, it just felt like a formality. It's like, who next? Mm-hmm. Who's, who's, who's in line to get this ass beaten? Because this team's going to walk right through you. And, yeah, this, I mean, I think you talked about it. Mike Rosano stills, uh, pass breakup. Need to be uh, a shout out on here. I think I, mean, I got everything else, but I mean, I mean even Jalen Her- uh, Harrell's. I mean, he stopped a fourth down convert. You know, he even yes, even got into coverage there. Um, but yeah, like so, like the argument is only a few big plays. But you know what? On the road, in a hostile environment, I guess one of the best teams in the country, the number two team in the country. Like you can't find excuses to demore to de- uh, to diminish a team capitalizing on your mistakes. The second CJ, uh, or excuse me, the second Cornelius Johnson touchdown catch from McCarthy, he put, was it Hick, Ronnie Hickman or, or yeah. Ransom in a blender? I mean, I mean, you want to, oh, like, oh, it's a broken coverage. No, nah, he put that. <laughs> like, no, he, he burned him. Out. Yeah. So, and, and I mean, whatever, dude, like, I mean, it is what it is, but this, like for me, my top three best things ever are like beating Notre Dame, beating Michigan State, and then this newfound love that I haven't experienced in forever because obviously getting our ass pounded for 20 years. But watching Ohio State fans in their own stadium sit in their seats and just shake their head and cry and piss and moan. And just, I, I've said it before too. Like Buckeye tears are like adrenaline for my body. I absolutely love it. I can't say it enough. And just talking about it and visualizing it just makes me so goddamn happy. And when I see in the commercials and in the and the memes and everything, whatever, just sitting there pounding, pissing, and moaning. It's like, dude, we dealt that for twenty years. And sure, everyone's passionate about their favorite teams, like we are. I said it's my religion. When you sit here. And just expect that no one's ever going to take you down. And when you get dropped from the mountaintop like that, it's I fucking love it, dude. Absolutely love it. Yeah, I could talk about this game for hours, honestly. You know, the, the one thing that I've always said about Ohio State that Michigan lacked was big playability. Like, Michigan just doesn't score on big plays. They have to basically nickel and dime you drive the ball down the field pound it you know between the tackles and a lot of times that's just not a success for scoring a lot of points and being successful long term in this game they scored six touchdowns five of them were for 45 yards or more Mm -hmm. just absolutely dominated the big plays and if you look at the stat chart you know mecca buka marvin harrison jr by the way, seen up top, uh, power rankings mock draft next year. Both of those guys were mocked top ten. Marvin Harrison was mocked top two. So these are NFL wide receivers per the per the specialists. They both went off. Mm. Nine for one twenty five, a touchdown for Abuka. Seven for one twenty, a touchdown for Marvin Harrison. It wasn't enough. Michigan did everything they needed to in this game, and uh, as of right now, 
they got Ohio State's number, winning two in a row and winning back-to-back Big Ten championships in this season, not losing to a single Big Ten team. So, um, big-time win. Final 45-23 in Columbus. Anything else? Um. I mean, we could probably, I could probably ramble on for for another few minutes, but we got two more games to go. Let's hit uh, number two here. Number two. It's the 2021 Big Ten Championship game. Number two, Michigan, 11 and one on the season, is going up going up against number 13 Iowa, who's 10 and two on the season. Michigan has just beaten Ohio State for the first time. In 10 years, they're on an emotional high, okay? Uh, Tragedy in Oxford, Michigan, school shooting. Number 42 football player and wrestler Tate Myrie, I believe his last name was, uh, had been killed trying to stop the shooter. Uh, Kind of a really sad situation. This is the patch. Matter of fact, if you're on YouTube, you can kind of see it's on my jersey. They wore this in the Big Ten Championship game. It's his number with four other hearts underneath. Uh, kind of shows the uh, – symbolizes the students that had been killed tragically. Uh, this was a game that we kind of talked about a second ago. It kind of fell in Michigan's lap. It was kind of different than 2022 where it feels very um, business trip. This felt like – is Michigan even ready for this? Like they were only preparing to beat Ohio state. They weren't preparing to win the big 10. They weren't even preparing to play this game. Like it felt very like we're playing with house money. Yeah. You into this game. I know you held this game in super high regard. Take it away. Yeah, this was, uh, like I said, you know, Purdue national or, excuse me, Purdue Big Ten Championship business trip. This one was complete emotional high. Uh, so Purdue, like I said, was 80-20. Michigan here was about 70-30 uh, in terms of fandom. Uh, you know, being there, the sights, the sounds, and I, 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 the only regret I have about this game is that you and my friend Kenny weren't there because uh, uh, Kenny, one of my best friends, you know that he was really the one that got me into Michigan football like hardcore, and you obviously being you right, and uh, so you guys not being there was probably one of my only regrets. But like there was just something about that atmosphere. Like after the emotional Ohio State win the week prior, like I'm literally fighting back tears this entire game, and being um, <clears throat> you know um, not sober probably played a little bit into it but um it was all smiles and happy tears man it was absolutely phenomenal the the michigan crowd was so loud and you know going into this i i had a feeling that iowa could make something sneaky about this but i was pretty confident michigan could win this um but that stadium lucas oil i don't like nfl stadiums too much but that that was being in a dome when Donovan edwards did the the halfback pass to to roman wilson when Blake Corum had that long rushing touchdown, like it was just so freaking awesome. And then when the game was pretty much out of reach in the second half, you know, Cade McNamara, uh, Mer- excuse me, Cade McNamara dials up uh, Luke Schoonmaker a few times, and then uh, Eric All has one handed catch in the end zone. Like right, like I said, right when it was out of reach, and Iowa fans started to file out and they started to to, to sit back in their seats and be quiet, and all the Michigan fans are getting rowdy. It was uh, just something I'll remember for the rest of my life. And I, when you and Brad were live for your Sunday live for NFL, and I called the show, and I was bawling my eyes out. Like, I just I was so got him hat. And um, so, yeah, I'll remember this to my dying day. And uh, it was funny, real quick before I pass it off, is because of uh, my sobriety or whatever. Um, I won't tell you what I was on. But uh, I'm sitting there, and so I'm on the end of the seats, and everyone's to my right. And uh this family of three is next to me, and uh, the the mother is next to me at one point, and she asks if she because she sees that I'm taking a selfie with everybody, and uh, she she's like, hey, uh, she's like, I'm pretty good at taking pictures. I can help you out because she can see I'm struggling with it. And, like I'm like seeing 
double and triple. And I just kind of like smile at her like 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 a half shitty eating grin and I just stare I just turn my head it looks straight and I'm thinking in my head I'm like don't make this weird don't make this weird and like she probably thought I was so freaking like spaced out of my mind but it didn't matter dude I had a great time <clears throat> um I believe you have a story about a father's son in this game too yeah that was another that real yeah real quick that was another thing that really choked me up when I called too is uh is in front of us was like a father, grandfather, and um, obviously the father, son, and whatever. And the, and the father, son is like probably 10, 11 years old. So 10, 11 years old, hasn't seen a lot of Michigan success, right? And when, when I seen that the father is, you know, embracing and hugging his son, I like, I started getting emotional watching that because like that was like the epitome of what sports is all about, you know, sharing moments. Uh, with your friends and family, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get emotional talking about it right now. But yeah, like that was that, that was awesome. You know, the high fiving to people you don't know can't beat it, man. Absolutely can't beat it. Yeah, this was kind of a weird situation because <clears throat> we had kind of had like this this unwritten pact. You knew that you could have access to Big Ten championship tickets. Um. For a decade almost, it seemed like. As long as I've known you, you're like, hey, Jeff, if we ever get to go to the Big Ten Championship, I can get tickets. Um, you just got to tell me yes. And I'm like, well, of course. Yeah, duh. Yeah. And for years, 2016 comes to mind. Uh, 2018 Revenge Tour comes to mind. Those two felt like, yeah, we'll be in, we'll be in Indianapolis next weekend. Like, I'm canceling yeah. plans, you know? It didn't work out. And 2021 felt possible, but like we weren't even thinking about the Big Ten Championship. We were just like, can we just can we beat Ohio State already? Like, this is all we want. Mm-hmm. And I don't, for the life of me, remember what I had going on. I believe my wife was out of town, if I'm not mistaken. She had yeah. already had plans to leave town and she, my wife never leaves town ever and she had plans to go with her mother i believe and her sister somewhere i think they went up to michigan i don't quite remember exactly what was going on but i had the kids and i've never with my like just my like me with the kids is my wife does not do a lot of whole lot of things on her own and uh basically at the very last minute i was able to get a babysitter but you had already had to give the ticket up, which I totally understood. It's like, I didn't want to be the guy to then ask this guy. It was just one of those things where I, I accepted defeat. Yes. I can't go. It is what it is. And uh, I watched the game from home. Obviously, this felt, it, it was a weird feeling the entire day. This game's at night. And it's just like, I, I'm just okay with being Ohio State. Like, I did, truthfully... I mean this without discrediting this game. I didn't care if we won. Like yeah. It was like, it didn't hit me the same. We'll talk about that game in a second. I can't wait. You obviously already, you guys already know what's number one. Let's be real. <laughs> um, but uh, Blake Corum started this game out with a long touchdown run. My memory isn't the touchdown, but J.J. McCarthy running past him to throw a block mm. was huge. Um, a few plays later, Donovan Edwards takes uh, a sweep or, a, or a, like a, a toss and ends up standing up and just diamond up Roman Wilson better than Tom Brady could. Just an absolute dime of a throw. And hits him in stride. He walks in. It's 14-3. It seems like Michigan's going to roll. And then they play really sloppy for a little while. And. They end up rolling off 28 straight, so it didn't really matter. But Hassan Haskins gets a couple of touchdowns in here. Michigan throws two picks in this game. They, they really did not play a great game of football, but they absolutely dominated Iowa, and that's all that really mattered. So um, Michigan was favored by 12. That, to both of us, felt very high. We're like, we're just, we just want to win. Like, yeah. who cares about the 12? And obviously the, the conspiracies with Iowa, which we've talked about in the past episodes on this on this rankings list, Iowa has not been a good opponent to us. We've had our our failures with them, but we dominate them and and uh, move on to the college football playoffs. So uh, I don't have, I don't think I have anything more. Oh, the fact that they wore number forty two on their jersey 
for Tate Myrie. They scored exactly 42 points. Um, yeah. That was kind of a cool touch. It, uh, it, it didn't cap off the season because there was another game to go for the college football playoffs. But man, what this is a hell of a season at this point. Like we're just, we were riding so high and playing with house money and everything just felt like it was meant to be. Mm-hmm. Number one. Number one. It's the 2021 Michigan versus Ohio State. The game. Number five, Michigan, 10 and one versus number two, Ohio State, 10 and one. Michigan had lost, unfortunately, on the road at East Lansing. Ohio State had lost, I believe it was week two, at home to Oregon. Both teams had a big time loss to a ranked opponent. This was a big time game. The winner's going to Indianapolis. Michigan had not beaten Ohio State since 2011. <clears throat> the Buckeyes had won an unprecedented 26 games in a row in the Big Ten. Second to only their own record of 30 in a row. They had won 21 straight against ranked Big Ten opponents. So just an absolutely unprecedented feat. Before I turn it over, if you don't mind, I'm going to take away a memory here of before the game started. We decided, I don't think it was last minute, but we decided that we were going to tailgate this game. Yeah. And it is projected to be rainy slash snowy. We're not even sure where we're going to set up shop. We 99% of the time, it's on the golf course. And it's closed. And it's closed. And we don't even know this until literally, like, I think, I, don't, I think it was pending that day, even, I yeah. think, if I remember correctly. We're driving up there, and we're rolling six, seven cars deep. Um, We stop at this, I don't even know. To be honest, I couldn't tell you what the business was. We end up buying, like, four spots and then two additional spots just to set up our camp. Mm -hmm. And we're there super early in the morning. We're getting everything going. We got heaters. We got everything. Mm -hmm. And Josh, your your friend Josh, and shout out Josh. Uh, me and him are like, we're gonna walk up to the M Den, and it's probably a twenty five minute walk or so, and it's probably ten o'clock at this point, maybe ten thirty. It's it's getting close to game time. We're walking up there in the snow. It's just drizzling. It's just mm -hmm. drizzling, and. Uh, we go inside the M Den and we get our gear and we come back out. And college game day is literally directly across the street from us. And when I say directly across the street, like I can't throw a football super far. I could have thrown a football to Desmond Howard. I mean, that's how close we are. We're not very far away. And they set up a pop up tent, M Den, for those of you that have never been to Ann Arbor on game day. It's right there at the four corners. College game day is literally right there in front of Pioneer, directly across the street, Kitty Corner is Michigan Stadium. We're, the street is completely closed off. There are people literally everywhere in the snow slowly coming down. And I just look at Josh, and I'm like, this feels like our day, man. This feels like our day. <laughs> and as we're walking back to the to the camp, and I'm screaming nonsense at Buckeye fans. I'm like, Michigan by a billion. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> screaming at people, and they're screaming OH back, and Ohio State was well represented in this game. You can rewatch it if you'd like. Um, they always are, unfortunately. They always are. Go ahead and take it away. Yeah, this, uh, you know, we, real quick, though, when we drove up for the uh, the Michigan Ohio State hockey game in Cleveland or whatever, and my cousin Ron was telling you that I've kind of, like, assumed this facilitator role of, like, being everyone's fucking mother hen, you know? This is 100% true, by the way. And so, like, when it comes to Michigan tailgating or whatever, I just I always enjoyed it. I just enjoyed the game day experience so passionately so much where, like, yeah, you know, back when I worked at Michelin, I would always take 
like if I knew I was tailgating that weekend, I always say a half day of vacation time off on Friday. I hit Meyer, I hit Dick's Sporting Goods, wherever I needed to go. I pack everything the night before. I make a list, make cross my T's, dot my I's. And there's just something about it where it's just super fun. You get to hang out with everybody and it's very stressful because one, you have like you said, six or seven cars. You can try to stay in line on the freeway. You're, you know. Turn them down the side street. You're trying to get on the golf course if possible with six deep when you have three rows of cars from different parts of the intersection converging. converging. It's just a lot going on. But at the end of the day, 99% of the time it all works out. So there's nothing to worry about. So we set up shop and a shout out to my, my mom and my aunt uh, and who helped cook all the food who help bring the tables, who set up, whatever. Like, I like I love doing the tailgating thing, whatever, but I can't do anything all that without you guys, you know, helping set up and everything like that. It's a big production. And people who tailgate, we you guys know that. Like, there, you got a, a lot to set up. And the worst part about it is taking everything out and repacking it when you're, you know, drunk and whatever. And you're exhausted. But anyways, we're crying. Pretty festivities are out of the way. We're underneath our canopies. And um, we... Uh, in that parking lot because of the golf course closing and uh just like i mentioned before with after the cj touchdown last season like once aj henning scores the end around on the first on the first drive uh i didn't think i sat down the rest of the time just the nerves were going and this is a game again this was the emotional one this wasn't expected i thought we were going to lose and so anytime we score i'm I mean, I'll celebrate, I'll whatever, but I am not one. I am not relaxed whatsoever until the clock is zero, 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 and Mission's got a higher number in the score column than Ohio State does. So, like, everyone's like, "Holy crap, Dan! Holy crap!" I'm like, Dude, I, I'm not gonna cheer just yet. I, I've been, bro- my heart's been broken before, but Cade McNamara, you know. I love the dude. The, a lot of this game is, is on his shoulders outside of his on passes, of course. You know, didn't throw any touchdown passes, but, you know, dialed it up when he needed to. He only threw the ball six times in the second half, if I'm not mistaken. Hassan Haskins, five touchdowns, rivalry record, um, school record, uh, or tied school record for most of the game. Um, the The scenery, the atmosphere, I wish I could have been in the game but just being in the in the city itself, it was just beautiful. Um, I got a picture of Hassan Hassan's right now in the second touchdown where he's leaping in the end zone. It, um, I, I mean, it was just I, I started getting goosebumps and getting emotional just watching the highlights. Everybody on the field afterwards, he, there's nothing else like it. And you know, the best part about this, I sent you a text message the other day. The best part about this game was. Especially the not the second to last touchdown. You can start to, you started to see it on, on Hassan's fourth touchdown, but on Hassan's fifth touchdown, when it, the game is completely out of reach and he's on the goal line and he runs in there and the ball's hiked, Ohio State doesn't they back off. They don't even show any effort at all. When their will's broken, they know it's over. Chef's kiss. Absolute chef's kiss. That's all I gotta say about that. But you're right. Like even in this game, Ohio State's got so much talent, especially on offense. They're going to get their numbers. But 394 through the air, two touchdowns, and having three NFL wide receivers, you still couldn't get it done. You know, 50 degrees and sunny in Columbus, light flurries in Ann Arbor and 30 degrees. No excuses. Michigan Duck Dust trophy for you guys. We'll take the two dubs right now. I'm all for it. I need to go. Yeah. You know, the uh, I ranked after the season we did our we did our top five plays ish from the 2021 season. My number one play was the AJ Henning uh, end around. I believe it set the tone for this game. And I've said this a couple times on this pod, and I've said this to some friends. In 20 or 30 years, it'll be a trivia question. In 2021, Ohio State or Michigan scored six touchdowns. Hassan had five of them. Who had the other? It'll be a trivia question someday. And it was A.J. Henning to start this game off in what was a beautiful play call, an absolutely beautiful play call. And they followed that one carry up 
40 more carries, damn near 300 yards, and five more touchdowns. Um, Blake Corum on a bum ankle goes 55 right up the gut. He is tackled from behind, but like I said, he's playing on a bum ankle. Um, it is just – it is crucial play after crucial play breaking the will of this Ohio State team. And it's one of the more talented Ohio State teams of my life. C.J. Stroud just got drafted number two, literally uh, Thursday night. Jackson Smith at Jigba, first-round wide receiver to the Seattle Seahawks. Garrett Wilson, first-round wide receiver to the New York Jets. Chris Olave, first-round wide receiver to New Orleans Saints. First-round wide receiver, first-round wide receiver, first-round wide receiver. Bonkers. And the thing is, is they they do their business in this game. C.J. Stroud throws for 394. But I think what we do, you know, obviously Hassan Haskins um, repping the jersey. Uh, I, I personally, he is single handedly in charge of becoming my favorite Wolverine on this day. Uh, he put me in absolute tears over a sporting event, which I don't cry often. Um, couldn't hold it in. I. Called my daughter to let her know that we just beat Ohio State, you know. Um, that was super important to me. But we all the time get really caught up in offense. Uh, it is as much of a defensive performance in this game than anything else. Uh, Aiden Hutchinson, fucking warrior, dude. Three sacks in this game. He is unblockable. And part of my memories in my Gus Johnson voice, oh, ja, bo. Oh getting that late sack on uh on CJ Stroud in this one. It was it was just great, dude. It was a team win. Everyone contributed. And you know, Aiden Hutchinson, although four years at uh, in, in Ann Arbor, it felt very brief his career because obviously he really started one whole season, which was this one. And he forever cemented his legacy for getting three sacks in this game and and really propelling his Heisman talk at the end of the year. And you know, just like with 2022, there's no denying that Ohio State and Jim Knowles got a little stiffer on the defense. They were at home. They were they were licking their wounds after this game right here. But when, when 2021 happened, like, okay, yeah, Mac, like I said, McNamara hit a few play, plays over top when he had to. But, like, when during the run game, like, they just could not stop it. Didn't matter if it was Blake Horn, it's on Haskins. Like, you just get chewed up for yard you know chunk play after chunk play and i just could not believe my eyes like holy dude the son haskins is just running wild like you know tim bianca batuka got the got the yardage back in the 90s like son haskins got the touchdowns you know um it was absolutely great and i'll finish with uh for my part was so we're packing up and the Ohio State fans are trickling out of the stadium because now you ain't got no damn Michigan fan leaving right now seeing Mr. Brightside in the field. Now Ohio State fans are leaving. They're salty. Oh, you know, sun shines on dog's ass once a day or blind squirrel finds a night every once. So, like, they're already deflecting, which is adorable. And the snow is coming down the heaviest it's been all day. And we're stuck in traffic. Ain't nobody going anywhere. It took, like, three hours to get home almost i'm taking the back roads because the snow's coming down so hard you know it's better to go down a dirt road than it is the freeway um and then you know as we're getting it's just me and uh, my wife in the truck everyone else drove separate and uh we get in the car and i'm we're not even at the first light to turn right and it's been like a half an hour and my wife starts dozing off i was like what the fuck are you doing she's like what I'm like you should be booking a fucking hotel for next day fucking <laughs> you doing like so uh as soon as i go home i'm fucking you know i'm I'm booking a hotel which you're just booking you're hoping to book anything one bed a pillowcase i don't care and uh the tickets will worry about a second you know later you gotta at least find a place to sleep um you, you obviously are you either or but uh in my case like you said uh the guy my boss at work is an ohio state fan his whole family is you know bred to be scarlet and gray and for 10 years that i've known him essentially he's like you know if michigan ever wins i'll sell you my four tickets on the 50 yard line in the lucas oil and because you're ohio state because you guys have all this confidence they buy them every year in the springtime and then they sell them and dump them if they don't get there 
And so that's what he did to me. And the funny thing is, is they didn't want to resell them to me this past year because they were still butthurt that they got in their ass spent two years in a row. So I had to buy them myself, which were cheaper, by the way. But um, but yeah, that uh, 2022 and 2021, man. Glorious. Couple more things. You know, this game comes to an end. We're emotional. I'm, you know, I'm calling my daughter. I'm just on an all time high. My phone is blowing up. And uh, we're sitting there. We're taking all our photos. And we're, dude, we're in mass celebration mode like I've never seen. And Josh grabs his gold blue flag. He's standing on top of his truck. The snow is coming down. And he has just got the gold blue. Just as all these Buckeye fans are literally passing us, they're broken hearted. And I, I snapped this picture. I'm so glad I got a picture of him. Uh, you know, it's just, I've, since this game has been done, I've listened to the entire radio call on this game, Jim Brandstand and Dan Deardorff, which yeah. was the last Michigan game they ever called at, Mich at, uh, at Michigan Stadium. Thank God. Thank God it was a W. And I've list, I've seen the recaps. I watched it again this week. Uh, you know, every time. I, I say it jokingly, but I'm so serious when I say this. Every time there's a super light snow flurry, I'm back in Ann Arbor <laughs> yeah, I'm watching just... Hassan Haskins score again. And I, I say that like joking, but I'm so serious too. Like it just it brings it right back. And this till this day is the single greatest sporting day I've ever experienced of my life and I've watched six Super Bowl wins and I've seen Tom Brady win a seventh and none of these compare to this game. It's just, it all fails in comparison. Um, I'm glad you brought up Dan Deardorff because when you listen to the call, that was, he retired out, like you said, after the season and uh, you know, he's obviously a Michigan alum, former player for Bo and played in the NFL, called NFL games for a decade and a half almost. And, uh, it, even from the AJ Henning touchdown all the way to the end of the game, every time Mitchin scores, he's like having a heart. He's like, God love Dan Deodor. He's having a damn heart attack. He's like, yeah. like he is fanboying out so much. Yes. And, uh, so yeah, that was that was another great great note there. Or whatever that was another uh, yeah. They just keep coming to me, so I apologize. But here's another <laughs> one. Jim Harbaugh. He died on the sideline in, in 20. I don't not literally died, but the Jim Harbaugh era died on the sideline in Columbus in 2016. Ask a lot of Michigan fans. They'd agree with me wholeheartedly. And. I, I can't quite pinpoint. The exact thing that got us here, 42, 27 Ann Arbor here in 2021. But as soon as this game was over, he was revived. As soon as this game was over, he was revived. And I mean, the dude didn't wait five minutes. He's at the press conference and t telling the world that Ryan Day was born on third base. So I, literally, we missed him. People wanted him fired, and rightfully so. Um, but this game revived Jim Harbaugh, and man, this program's rolling, man. Uh, we just talked about 2022, back-to-back -back wins against Ohio State, back-to-back -back Big Ten championships, back-to-back -back college football playoff appearances, um, number one recruiting class in the nation as this podcast is being recorded. This is all we've ever wanted. It started with 2021. This team was different. They proved it on this day, and they've continued to prove it. Um, that's all I got. Yeah. Um... You want to get into our post reaction of the uh, the whole ranking show here? Yeah, I do have some questions for you as it pertains okay. to the rankings. If you if you got a second, oh, let's do um, it. Like I said, yeah, we got a lot to get to. We still, we ain't done yet. I know, man. We took a while, but to be honest, those five games deserved every minute we've given it. So why? So my exact rankings was twenty twenty one Ohio State, twenty twenty two Ohio State. 2021 Big Ten Championship, 2022 Big Ten Championship, 2016 Michigan State. 
your rankings was how exactly how we laid it out today. Why 2021 Big Ten Championship over the 2022 Ohio State game? The Big Ten Championship over the 22 Ohio State game? Uh, like, like I said, how I ranked this when we, or when we gave our criteria, mine was a lot of had to do being there personally. And like I said, being somewhere where I haven't been before, as a, watching it as a fan on TV or just being there in person, man, it's just something about, you know, neutral atmosphere, uh, seeing an opposing fan base in the same stadium as me, and um, just the environment and just having everything come together, I guess, for me. And that's why, like, it's just a lot of that has to do with me being there personally. So that's the case, which I figure was the case. Why 2016 Michigan State over the 2022 Big Ten Championship game? Um, on one hand, business trip against Purdue. Uh, not the most, um, you know, formidable opponent. I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish. No, that's, that's a fair argument. That is a fair but, argument. But with Michigan State, it's the first rivalry win for Jim Harbaugh. And it's a rivalry game. And like I've been preaching this whole series on the road like, and smacking a rival. That's why. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, bigger legend 10 years from now, Hassan Haskins, or is it still Tim, Tim Biaka Batuka? Oh, boy. I think it depends on your generation. I think for our generation, it's going to be Hassan Haskins. That's fair. I, I mean, what, what Biaka Batuka did is great. But you got to be honest, even now in today's world, especially with Twitter, not a lot of people talk about it. Yeah. Um, does Michigan repeat the season they just had in 2022 with Cade McNamara? I think you can make the argument. Uh, I think it just there's going to be things that obviously happen a little bit differently. I think it, I think you could make the argument for that. Um, the only thing that I really, for a while there said about the difference between the two was JJ with the legs and extending the plays he can make with doing that. He makes plays that are um, not going to be there if K's under center. So I, I you can make an argument. Last thing. This is strictly a prediction question. There's no right, wrong. There's whatever. How many games from the 2023 season would make this list today? 2023 season? So I'm – oh. Um, you got – I'd say probably it could be two or three, especially with being on the road for Penn State and Michigan State and then having Ohio State at home. I'd say you have two or three. Interesting. Low ball on it. <laughs> Big Ten Championship? College well, football playoff? Okay. okay. Okay, Jeff. I'm talking about regular season, but I say two, three. Okay, five or two, three. <laughs> two to five. <laughs> two to five. Okay. <laughs> All right. What you got? All right. So I, I'll, I'll follow this up after you're done. But uh, from doing the series, what would you learn? Yeah, um, total respect for the 2015-2016 players um, that just unfortunately weren't able to beat Ohio State. They played in some kick-ass games. They beat some really good football teams, and they are solely judged because they couldn't beat Ohio State. 18 falls in the same category. 15 was better than they're going to get credit for, but because it was Harbaugh's first year, it just didn't work out. The timing wasn't quite there. Um, 2016 and 2018 teams, though, those are all timers. Uh, another team, another thing that I kind of learned is AJ, or not AJ, uh, Shea Patterson, he's a tough son of a bitch. And he's going to be judged off the fact that he couldn't beat Ohio State, which rightfully so. Um, but yeah, just an absolute dog. And I think last but not least is like and and I Rome wasn't built in a fucking day. 
like going back and like reliving this timeline it sucks at times because it's like yeah this was a really good game but i wish we had more ohio state on here or even just reliving the fact that like we couldn't include any college football playoff wins um you know there there were there's plenty of games 2016 ohio state 2021 michigan state um Gosh, twenty is it? Is it twenty twenty eighteen Florida State bowl game that should be on there? There should be so many more games that we were discussing. Um, that's what I learned. What about me, you? Yeah, for me, we just Jim Harbaugh beat a lot of good teams. Obviously, you know, beating who was ranked at the time and whether it was on the road or at home, obviously was an issue too. Um. So, obviously, the glaring ones was, you know, it took them a minute to get, I mean, it's you're still dealing with the Michigan State woes, still dealing with the Ohio State woes, but obviously, you know, you feel like the pendulum's swinging in the other direction. Um, another one is, you know, where Michigan was from 2015 to 2020, you know, compared to these last two seasons, it's like we're, we're turning the page here that the program is, is, is kind of at, at its peak all time. You know, especially in terms of how many, you know, 13 wins. It's the first ever. Uh, I don't, I know that right now, me personally as a fan, if we revert back to what the, what this, uh, this era under Jim started out with, I don't know if I can handle it. I think we just have to, you have to, you're, we got here and now we have to keep progressing and, and get and bring home a fucking national championship undisputed. Um, I don't know how I'm going to react if that ever happens. Um, I feel like now where we're at now, I think the absolute floor is 2016. You can't go anywhere below 2016. It's from that's just where we're at as a program now, in my opinion. And, and, again, and if, it, if it does, it better be because we're just decimated with injuries, snake bitten. It can't be because we're just poorly coached. Like right. that can't be an excuse. Right. And I'm about to talk about that uh, poorly coached right now is. All right, so we have Shea's legacy, and you asked me a question last week about my overall take on Shea, and, you know, I felt like I might be a little bit unfair to him like I was to Real Peppers, but, you know, Shea, you know, he, he won a lot of good games, and, and, you know, one of the things he did was he uh, he went 2-0 against Michigan State. Um, and one of the issues I had, which I forgot to bring up last week, was, you know, you know Donald People jones number one wide receiver in his recruiting class. Nico Collins was a great physical, tall, big jump ball receiver. One of my favorites. Tariq Black, uh, you know, tight ends galore. Like, to me, and that was the frustrating thing, is, like, how, even now, there's still times where it's like, how the, we have all these talented big guys. How are we not throwing a jump ball three times a game in the in the red zone? Michigan's had red zone woes the last two seasons. How are we not, you know, when Eric All was healthy or, you know, Colson Loveland more? It's like, these guys got heights. Throw the damn ball up. You got the talented quarterback. And so with Shea Patterson, that was my thing, too, is, like, Grant, his defense didn't help him out a lot. But, um, you know, the speed and space with Josh Gaddis, that's the coaching thing I'm talking about, Josh Gaddis. Like, up until 2021, Josh Gaddis, the whole speed and space was dead. There was a game where it popped off, and then another game where it's like, this, this coaching plan for this game is fucking atrocious. To be and, fair, in 2021, Josh Gaddis, I give him damn near zero zero credit. True, true a because a lot of it's offensive line, right? And my car and quarterback play, right? Like, that, that, was like, that that felt a lot like Jim Harbaugh's fingerprints were on it, and it was more of a more of a hybrid. It was like speed and space, but running, not passing. Um, but so yeah, those were really like the three key things that I kind of learned about this, and you know, I. My, my opinion hasn't changed on on Shea, but um, you know it's still. I, I like I said, we we bought a Rolls Royce, and instead we had we got you know a Tesla. You know it it wasn't uh, it didn't show out like we wanted it to, and it showed. Yeah. Anything else for me? For questions, um, no. Uh, did, did you have any more? Or do we want to get into the uh, Barcelona Big Cat? That was all mine. Go ahead and take it away. So if anyone hasn't seen, uh, I think it was yesterday, or maybe it was earlier today, um, you know, Barcelona Big Cat, obviously, you know, um, 
probably the number two in, in that whole realm over there on uh on that whole you know business side of everything with uh portnoy i know he had a he has a podcast himself and he had um busting with the boys on and so taylor lawan was on there and he was busting taylor lawan's nuts about um you know michigan back in the 1890s 1900s for playing you know bum ass teams high school teams you know the joke was that when they looked it up that in like 1904 michigan played phys uh physicians and surgeons so i did a little deep dive myself and I, he, dan i haven't seen what dan responded with but i know he got lit up in his mentions especially for michigan fans about a lot of different things of the landscape of college football at that time and you know technology a lot of schools scheduled certain programs and other teams based on regional and uh, transportation purposes, because not everybody had a car back then, let alone a car even being invented. Um, so I want to know your, your take on it and uh, real quick. And then uh, I, like I said, I kind of went down a little bit, a bit of a rabbit hole. I have a few fun facts about the Big Ten Conference. And then because Dan Kess is, I believe, is a Wisconsin Badgers fan, I brought, I got some notes on Wisconsin. Ohio State, because I know those fans love to jump on us about the 1900s in Michigan. So go ahead. I want to hear your comments about that. And because I know you should, I know you've saw the clip. Yeah, I don't have strong comments as it pertains to the 1900s and how football was being played or who they were playing. I will say this. Um, regardless of who was playing football in the 1900s, there was nobody better at it than Michigan. Literally, nobody. They were winning all their national championships in the 1900s. And I understand that that could be viewed as discreditable in today's day and age. That's fine. Just like in the mid-90s, we were giving away half national championships to teams that had the equal um, records. You know, Michigan's half natty, as as you love to even say. And I, I gave you a hard time the other day. I was like, can we just stop that shit? It's not like Michigan chose to take a half natty. Mm -hmm. You know, Michigan would have played one more game. It, it, that wasn't what the circumstance was, you know. Um, so I'll say this in, in my quick closing here. I, I don't have a strong opinion, but I do think that, like, if we're going to just discredit the 1900s, when does football start? Like, who makes that choice? Is it 2000s on now? Is like is that where we're at? Like, for me personally, I don't even like to talk about football mm. before 2006 because roughly 2005, 2006 is when I became like an overnight super fan of football in general. Right. And I'll go back a little bit because I have, I wouldn't say the word study, but I'm, I'm pretty good student of football in the 2000s like mm -hmm. i can talk about it pretty fluently and know what i'm talking about i'm not just talking about my ass um but prior to that in the 90s i don't have a wide range of knowledge i don't have a wide range of opinions and it's like unless we have somebody that's going to seriously cut the knife and say this is when football begins it's like can we just leave alone the fact that michigan was beaten up on harvard Mm -hmm. right so yeah yeah i just i wanted to bring that up too and and really real quick here like i said i have i have some fun facts about the big Ten conference a lot of people might might learn a, th uh, a few things here and after i go through this comments anything like that from you if you need and then like i said i for wisconsin ohio state michigan i have listed some of these quote unquote you know high school teams that all three of these programs have played and Essentially, everybody did, again, like we just commented on. So in 1895, so before, real quick, the Big Ten Conference, <laughs> so quick, <laughs> the Big Ten didn't get its name until like 1953, right? So let's just get that out of the way, you know, because everyone, you know, Christopher Columbus and the Pilgrims and all that shit went on the East Coast and everyone had to go migrate west, right? So before the Big Ten Conference in 1953, the name was, the Western Conference, hence Michigan's fight song, the Champions of the West. Yeah. So anyways, give me a moment here. 
1895, Purdue's president held a meeting in Chicago with fellow presidents from the University of Chicago, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Northwestern, and Lake Forest to discuss intercollegiate sports. One of the big topics they talked about was student athletes eligibility. Now, the Intercollegiate Conference of Faculty Representatives was formed in 1896. This was obviously the precursor or the the newborn child of the Big Ten. Lake Forest in 1896 was not at the meeting and then University of Michigan replaced them. The Big Ten Conference known as the Western Conference then consisted of Illinois, Northwestern, Purdue, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Chicago. The conference was known as the Big Nine after Iowa and Indiana joined. Ohio State joined in 1912. And then Michigan spent nine years out of the conference as an independent before rejoining at, uh, I think, 1917 it was. Between 1890 and 1905, there was 325 deaths and 1,149 injuries <laughs> in college football. So, obviously... Uh, some programs, some schools weren't even around. Some started before and 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 whatnot. But those are some some few things that you can find on Wikipedia that I thought were pretty cool. And a lot of that too, I I read for the first time today. So, is there any comments on that at all or anything? I mean, just they're just trying to play football, man. Right. I, that's it. That's all I got. Okay. So now, like I said, Dan Katz from Barstool, Wisconsin Badgers fan. Yeah. So he made fun of Michigan playing physical uh, physicians and surgeons, okay, in high school teams. So this is some of what Wisconsin played from like the 1890s to the 1910s, 15, the teens, whatever. Rush Medical, Madison High School, Grinnell, Belois, Wisconsin alumni, in which this game, Wisconsin currently lost. <laughs> seven nothing or eight nothing or something like that and then they also played physicians and surgeons with michigan they played ohio state before ohio state was even a major program ferris state albion case west virginia before they were a major physicians and surgeons kalamazoo american medical ohio state spent one year in 1904 is 1904 as an independent they became a major program in 1905 these are the schools that ohio state fans can eat shit with if they make fun of michigan fans for the wins in the 1900s ohio wesleyan oberlin western reserve which is basically the boy scouts camp sherman which was a national guard so back then camp sherman pretty sure they were learning how to dig foxholes and fix bayonets Denison. Denison is the college that Woody Hayes coached at with uh, Bo Schembechler. Mount Union, Ohio Medical, and the last one I thought was hilarious, Iowa Navy Flight School. So they all did it. So <laughs> it all depends on when your school started their program. So I thought that was absolutely hilarious that, like, now, not everybody knows that, but what I'm saying is now that ammo can't be used at any other one program. It was all regional. Like I said, you, people took trains, horse buggies. Like, football teams weren't, you know, 83-man rosters. But you know what? You, you had to transport these people. And the biggest thing they had problems with is not only scheduling people to play, but keeping kids from dying on the football field. <laughs> I'm like, I saw 325 deaths. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> I'm not laughing at the death. I'm laughing at just like how silly it is to just look back and criticize the time period. Like, it is what it is. Like, yeah. that, like I'm sorry, but like, at some point, we were all toddlers learning how to walk. We, mm -hmm. we weren't just, you know, Usain Bolt didn't walk out the womb sprinting, okay? It, it, Rome wasn't built in the day. Like, I don't know. It's just like the whole thing is very silly to me. It's just like Michigan just happens to be the team that dominated in that time period, you know? Yeah. And so. it really wasn't because um, if you go to, you know, sports reference is like the the very basic website. But if you go to like yeah. college football reference or pro football reference, obviously you can look any pretty much a lot of stats on everybody. 
college football, it's a little black and gray of who played when. But, but anyways, if you um, if you go on college football reference, um, a lot of these schools, too, it didn't take till about like the 1930s to where everyone has really got some like top of the line, you know, uh, competitive football going on. Like it took till like the 1930 season to really not have these prep schools on here on this list. You know what I'm saying? So like, um, you know, the SEC obviously saw it get formed, the Big East, you know, all that stuff. But anyway, so yeah, I just thought that it had to be addressed. And like I said, I don't, I don't know if Dan Katz responded to anything like that. He probably didn't, but um, yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the Michigan fans got a little, uh, got their feathers ruffled, mine included, but I wanted to know about this. I'm like, there's no way that Michigan's the only team that, uh, you know, had to pay someone to get dismantled, you know, but anyways. Yeah. Well, anything else? Yes, I do have one more. And then after this, I'm good. Um, but speaking of the draft last week uh, before we close the show, I figured it'd be a good thing to bring up one more time, especially after this draft happening. Um, so starting from Bo Schembechler, I'm going to make my way up to Jim Harbaugh. And most draft picks and first rounders during their time coaching in Ann Arbor. So with Bo Schembechler, uh, from 1970 to 1990, and then these are the draft years because obviously he coached in '69. So 1970 to 1990, and also remember, uh, Bo Schembechler, Gary Moeller, in those two time periods, there was more than seven rounds. Uh, so Bo Schembechler for '70 to '90, 124 draft picks, 13 first rounders. Gary Moeller, 1991 to 1995, 25 picks, seven first rounders. Lloyd Carr, 1996 to 1908, 62 draft picks, 10 first rounders. Rich Rodriguez, 2009 to 2011, seven picks, one first rounder. Uh, which I'm trying to remember who that Brandon. actually was. Brandon. Who? Brandon. Brandon. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Brady Hoke, 2012 to 2015, 11 picks, one first rounder. Jim Harbaugh, 2016 to obviously current, 53 picks, nine first rounders. And with the upcoming draft in 2024, very good chance that he's going to send about 10 more guys in the NFL. Nuts. Yeah, he's got, I mean, people that put Bo on a, on a pedestal, and don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to discredit Bo by any means here. Jim Harbaugh is already humming better than Bo ever did. Yeah. So, Jim's winning consistently 10, win, 10 games a year. He's putting multiple guys in the NFL. He's winning Big Ten title games now. He's beating Ohio State, beating Michigan State, um, making the play. I mean, this is this is what we've wanted, and this is what he's doing now. So definitely humming along. Well, what a series. Um, 21 of the top games under the Jim Harbaugh era from 1 to 21 with uh, seven honorable mentions. So really, we gave you about 28 games. Um all W's, no no losses in there whatsoever. Um, yeah, I I enjoyed this. I know you did too. If you're listening, I you know tell a friend about it, tell a Michigan Wolverine fan about it, tell an Ohio State fan about it, tell whoever you want about it. Uh, share it around. I've been sharing the YouTube version because to be honest, I think that's what's getting a lot of the hits. So um, check us out on YouTube. You'll see this beautiful Hassan Haskins jersey. You'll see that bright maze jersey Dan's got on. Uh, yeah, hope you guys are digging this. Dan, anything else? No, man. It was, it was an honor to, to do this with you. And, uh, you know, we're still in May. We just started May. It's May 2nd right now as we're recording. And we have a lot of ideas cooking up to uh, keep content pushing until we start getting the fall camp. And then, I mean, August, really, fall camp really starts at the end of July. I mean, we're going to be right there around the corner and, you know, football's going to be picking up soon again. And so before you know it, we'll be talking preview. Yeah. All right. Well, like I said, hope you guys are digging this. It's the top 21 games of the Jim Harbaugh era at Michigan. Um, we'll be back next time. We're out. Go Blue. Real talk. Go Blue.